All right, so we're back. Uh, hopefully, the audio is good. Uh, hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. Uh, we were trying to broadcast, had technical difficulties there, had bad audio. So hopefully, I'm coming through now. So I want to talk about two things. Breaking news story dealing with Donald Trump. You know, we first reported this um, we first reported this uh, on Tuesday night, uh, this past Tuesday, May 9th. You, you, you have a new development in this story once again. Okay, everybody share this broadcast on your own Facebook page. Invite your friends to tune in also. So you have a new development once again, okay? Uh, so every, so Tuesday, uh, it's about 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time or so, uh, uh, Donald Trump fired FBI Director James Comey. OK, Donald Trump fired FBI Director James Comey. OK, and all along uh, coming out of the White House, they said that the firing had nothing to do with the Russia investigation. OK, all along, they said the firing had nothing to do with the Russia investigation. OK, well, come to find out now, Donald Trump is interviewed by Lester Holt uh from uh nbc news right and uh you have two articles tonight one from the washington post and one from uh the hill.com talking about this story and they're, they're talking about it uh on uh, uh msnbc as well so uh the washington post and i got a, a email alert from the uh washington post uh a breaking uh breaking story email alert uh, tonight and I looked at it I said what I said so Trump says he was thinking of quote unquote this Russia thing when he decided to fire Comey Donald Trump said he was thinking of this Russia thing when he decided to fire Comey okay can you all hear me okay I want to make sure can y'all hear me all right okay because uh, um, we had technical difficulties okay so they said Nita said it's much better Nita Sunshine okay Pernell, how y'all doing? All right. So look, what I'm going to do is I have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. I have fifteen articles dealing with this topic. Okay, I have fifteen articles dealing with this topic, and I just stopped at that fifteen. I have more, but we ain't gonna go more than fifty. Sixteen plus what what happened uh, Wednesday with Sally Yates, uh, uh, her testimony uh, in, in front of the U.S. Senate. So what I'm gonna do? We're gonna start with the breaking news story first. Then we're going to go back. I did a broadcast Tuesday night that talked about Trump firing Comey. And uh, you can go back and watch that uh, the African History Network, our Facebook fan page. Click on videos. You see I have hundreds of videos there. Okay. All right. So shout out to everybody. And then also what we're going to do in this broadcast, I'm going to do a quick overview of an online course that I teach called Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa. Understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa. Understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. And uh, this is an online class that I teach that uh, meets on Friday, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And uh, you can register for that class if you like. We do it thousands of years of history, et cetera, et cetera. So, on the back, uh, so second thing we'll do, we'll do a, a, a brief overview of that class, of that uh, online class that I teach tonight because it meets, uh, uh, meets on Fridays, okay? And um, all right, and we just posted the information there uh, if you want to register for that class. Okay, so since Tuesday, what's coming from the White House is saying that FBI Director James Comey was not fired because of the Russia investigation, okay, into uh, the Donald Trump campaign to see if there were uh, illegal ties to Russia, to see if there was collusion with uh, Russia, et cetera. All right. Now, when we look at the Washington Post article, the name of the Washington Post article is Trump said he was thinking of Russia when he decided to fire Comey. Recounting his decision to dismiss the FBI director, the president told he's not my president, so I don't call him president. If it's an article, I may refer to him as president because they say with an article. No, he's if he's a president, he's the first Russian president. He's not my president to hell with him. But uh, Donald Trump told NBC News, he said, quote, I said to myself, I said, you know, 
this Russia thing with Trump and Russia is a made up story. It's an excuse by the Democrats. Okay. Quote unquote. Now his account flatly contradicts the white house's initial version of events and undercuts denials by his aides, uh, that the move was influenced in any way by his growing, uh, uh, uh fury with the ongoing Russia probe. When we look at the article from the hill.com from tonight, just two hours ago, the hill.com Trump said made up Russia story, part of decision to fire Comey. It says president Trump said he decided to fire FBI director James Comey in part because of the investigation into his ties to Russia telling NBC news. Now he was interviewed by Lester Holt today. So you've seen clips of the videos going across your timeline. You may have seen it on uh, MSNBC or NBC uh, uh, news tonight. Okay. He was interviewed by Lester Holt in the interview today. He said, quote, when I decided to just do it, I said to myself, you know, this Russia thing with Trump and Russia is a made up story. All right. Now, Let's start with the most recent and go backwards because there's a lot here. And I would have broadcast it earlier, but the story kept changing. We've seen the story change like three or four times for, since Tuesday. Last night, two big articles, one bomb from CNN, another bomb from the Washington Post. Okay, we'll get to that in just a minute. All right. So the, the article most recently came out a couple hours ago. Trump said he was thinking of Russia controversy when he decided to fire Comey. Uh, Trump on Thursday said, uh, okay, he was thinking of, of this Russia thing with Trump uh, when he decided to fire FBI Director James Comey, who had been leading the counterintelligence investigation into Russia's interference in the 2016 election. Okay, now here's the thing. Now you have a lot of people saying, wait a second, this sounds like obstruction of justice. This sounds like obstruction of justice. Ob obstruction of justice was one of the charges that... Um, uh, they were going to bring uh, against uh, Nixon, Richard Nixon, uh, uh, to uh, impeach him. He ends up resigning. Okay, he ends up resigning from office. All right. Now notice what happened. He resi Nixon resigned from office. Um, he gets a pardon from Gerald Ford. Then over 40 people around Nixon, they went to prison. Nixon didn't go to prison. Nixon did not go to prison. About 40, uh, over 40 people around Nixon went to prison. Okay. Notice that. All right. Now recounting his, uh, um, decision to dismiss Comey, Trump told NBC news interviewed by Lester Holt. He said, in fact, when I decided to just do it, I said to myself, you know, this Russia thing, uh, with Trump and Russia is, is made up, is a made up story. It's an excuse by the Democrats for having lost an election. They should have won. Okay. So what he's saying has contradicted what his surrogates have been saying for the past two days, contradicted what, uh, uh, Sarah, uh, Huckabee Sanders said today, deputy white house press secretary. I saw her standing up there lying all day today during the white house, uh, press, uh, uh, conference. Okay. It contradicted what Kellyanne Conway, who's been, who, who has been saying it is, it, it's, it's contradicted what uh, Sean Spicer has been saying, uh, white house press secretary. Okay. Now Trump's account flatly contradict. This is what the Washington Post is saying. Trump's account flatly contradicts the white house initial account of how the president arrived at his decision, undercutting public denials by his aides that the move was influenced in any way by his growing fury, uh, fury, uh, with on, with the ongoing Russia probe later in the same interview with Lester Holt, Trump said he had no intention of trying to stop or hinder the FBI's Russia probe which is examining whether any Trump associates coordinated uh, with uh, Russians to influence the election. Trump also said he wants the probe to quote unquote, be absolutely done properly. Well, wait a second. If you if you fire the lead person on the investigation, what do you think is going to happen? Yes. You, yes. The investigation still goes on, but when you read stories about this, it, 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 they talk about how this, totally hit the FBI. It came out of the clear blue and their FBI agents are furious about this. Also. Now what happened was when you, when you read stories about this, Trump sent his bodyguard to deliver the, the handwritten the, to deliver the letter to the FBI headquarters firing, uh, Comey. Comey was in Los Angeles speaking to, 
uh, uh, FBI agents there, m members of uh, employees of the FBI. He was in Los Angeles, so he wasn't at FBI headquarters. But Trump sends his bodyguard to deliver the message. And some people are thinking that this is a, a way to intimidate people. OK, so you have this story from The Washington Post tonight. So check that one out. You have uh, this story from the hill dot com. OK, and with the hill dot com, they had a story uh, earlier today posted at 4 or 5 p.m. White House's FBI story unravels. White House's FBI story unravels. Now, I, I was on um, 9, 10 a.m., the Superstation this morning. Wake up with Steve Hood. I'm on every Thursday. You all see the Facebook Live broadcast I do every Thursday. We talked about it this morning. The story has changed since this morning. The story has changed since this morning, okay? The story has changed since yesterday by Trump's own admission, okay? So key portions, we look at this article from the, from the hill.com and the hill is a good, uh, you see, we post articles from the hill.com on our Facebook fan page, the African history network. They're, they are a good political news website, key portions of the white house explanation of how president Trump decided to fire FBI director James Comey came into question on Thursday, underlining a growing credibility crisis for the administration because they have no credibility. They keep lying every day. I've never seen anything like this. I've been in radio seven years. I've never seen anything like this before. Remarkably, it was Trump. It was Donald Trump himself who undercut statements from White House officials about the firing. In an interview with NBC's Lester Holt, the president said he made up his mind about getting rid of uh, FBI director James Comey even before receiving a recommendation from Deputy Attorney General Ron, uh, uh, Rod uh, uh, Rosenstein and Attorney General Jeff Sessions. Okay, so the story that came out last night, right? If you look at two, two big bombshell stories uh, came out last night. One was from CNN and the other was from the Washington Post, okay? All right, so the story from CNN was in, in all the other news outlets picked up this story. Source close to Comey says there were two reasons the FBI director was fired. Okay. Source close to Comey said there were two reasons the FBI director was fired. And this story was updated Thursday morning, 6 14 AM Eastern standard time, May 11, 2017. Okay. There are two reasons why Donald Trump, fired FBI director James Comey, Comey, according to a source close to the now former FBI director. One, Comey never provided the president with any assurance of personal loyalty. And if you see the news reports tonight, the, the, uh, um, the interview that Trump did with Lester Holt, he said in the interview, he said he was told three times by FBI Director James Comey that he was not under investigation himself. Trump himself was not under investigation. One of those times Trump said was at a dinner that he had with Comey and Comey asked, uh, Comey said he wanted to stay on as FBI director. Okay, this was early in the administration. Okay, we're in like, I think this is the 111th day of this regime, 111, 112 day, seems like four years. But it's like the 111th, 112th day. So he said he asked uh, Comey if he, he said, is there any way you can tell me possibly if, you know, I'm under FBI, uh, under investigation, something to that effect. I'll get the exact wording. Okay. And he said Comey told him was not under investigation. But at that dinner, reports are that uh, Trump asked Comey uh, of assurance of personal loyalty to Trump. And Comey said, well, I'll be honest with you, but I can't give you personal loyalty because Trump has a problem. He wants personal loyalty from people. The FBI director, their loyalty is to the U.S. Constitution. OK, so he said, Comey said, no, according to the reports. Now, number two, the fact that the FBI's investigation into possible Trump team collusion with Russia in the 2016 election was accelerating. So if you look at reports, if you look at reports regarding this and, and, and the uh, um, Wall Street Journal 
they have a big article about this. Uh, NBCnews.com had an article May 10th, Wednesday, May 10th, 2017. Comey had asked for more money for FBI's Russia investigation. Comey had asked for more money for FBI's Russia investigation. So this investigation started in July of 2016. During the campaign, this investigation started in July. It's ramping up. A senior congressional office official with direct knowledge told NBC News that James Comey briefed Congress in recent days that he had requested more staff and money for the Russia investigation from, from Deputy Attorney General Rod uh, Rosenstein. The New York Times first reported Wednesday that FBI director, well, former FBI director, former FBI director James Comey, who was fired on Tuesday, had asked uh, Deputy Attorney General uh, Rod Rosenstein for additional resources for the probe because the probe is accelerating. People are asking, uh, you know, Sarah Huckabee Sanders saying, well, you know, we want this to come to an end. It should come to an end. There's nothing there. No, you don't know what's there. You don't know what's there. It's accelerating, okay? And Trump knows this. Now, Tuesday night of my broadcast, I said the reason why Comey was fired, because Comey was getting too close. I said the reason why Comey was fired, because Comey was getting too close, okay? And what you see, what you see is that there's a pattern, there's a pattern um, with uh, people investigating Trump getting fired, all right? So, and I and in and, and the uh, broadcast I, I did Tuesday night, I talked about uh, uh, former uh, former Deputy uh, Assistant Attorney General Sally Yates, who tipped off the Trump administration that Lieutenant General Michael Flynn could be open to blackmail. She got fired. You had Preet Bharara, U.S. Uh, U, uh, U.S. Attorney for Manhattan. He was investigating some Trump issues, some Trump dealings. One of the things he was investigating, Preet Bharara, and we've talked about this in previous broadcasts, is the is Deutsche Bank. Now Deutsche Bank was had to pay millions of dollars in fines for laundering ten billion dollars in money from Russia. Okay, Deutsche Bank is the largest creditor to Donald Trump that we know of. He owes Deutsche Bank approximately $300 million. This is one of the cases Preet Bharara was, was, was looking into, okay? Another case Preet Bharara was looking into was Roger Ailes and sexual harassment lawsuits that were settled for millions of dollars by Fox News, and Roger Ailes was the CEO of Fox News. He got pushed out just in the last few months. This is and now Roger Ailes is good friends with Donald Trump, and he was a campaign advisor, either formally or informally, to Donald Trump. This is something else Preet Bharara was investigating. Preet Bharara was also investigating uh, possible illegal stock trades by Tom Price, who is the uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services in the Donald Trump administration. These are three cases that we know of Preet Bharara was investigating. Also, Preet Bharara, his resignation was asked for on a Friday. That Wednesday, there were articles, Washington Post had an article, ProPublica. You had three uh, government watchdog agencies that asked uh, Preet Bharara to look into um, uh, Donald Trump possibly uh, violating the emoluments clause of the U.S. Constitution, Article 1, Section 9, uh, which states that uh, a, a president cannot take, uh, cannot receive uh, any types of gifts, any type of money, anything like this from a foreign government, okay? This was public knowledge. Th these were articles, because I saw these articles, okay? This is something else he was investigating. Now, these are four cases that I know of he was investigating. And, and the other thing was Trump Towers was in Preet Bharara's jurisdiction as well in Manhattan. Okay, so May 10th, Wednesday, May 10th, finance.yahoo.com has an article. Trump has now fired three high profile federal officials who were investigating him and his associates. Trump has now fired three high profile federal officials who were investigating him and his associates.
They talk about attorney, uh, acting attorney general Sally Yates, former U.S. attorney Preet Bharara, FBI director James Comey. All three officials were pursuing separate but related inquiries into Russia's interference in the 2016 election and whether the Trump campaign had anything to do with it. Okay, Trump fired Comey unexpectedly one day after uh, former acting attorney general Sally Yates, who was fired by Trump in January after refusing to enforce his first immigration order. She testified before Congress and in her test, her testimony, she kicked their asses with her testimony. She kicked Ted Cruz's behind up and down his up and down his face. And then the other senator from Texas, she kicked his behind also. Okay. Her, I mean, her testimony was scary. People were talking about how credible, how credible she was. Her testimony was scary. Okay. So she testified before Congress, she testified before the, the U.S. Senate that she had warned the White House about former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn's contact with Russia, with, with, with Russia's ambassador to the U.S. during the transition, okay? And she went and met with the White House twice and had one telephone conversation with them. She met with Don McCann, the uh, uh, White House counsel, okay? So this was more than just a heads up like White House Press Secretary Sean Spicer tried to say it was. No, 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 no. She warned him that this guy could be open to blackmail, that this guy was dirty. So Yates' testimony came days after FBI Director James Comey reiterated during an open Senate Judiciary Committee hearing that the FBI was, was still, quote, conducting an investigation to understand whether there was any coordination between the Russian efforts and nobody and anybody associated with the Trump campaign, end quote. So check out this article from finance.yahoo.com. Trump has now fired three high profile federal officials who were investigating him and his associates. Okay. Now he's a mob boss. Now I tried to tell people I do. I've been, I do radio. We tried to tell people, look, this guy is crazy. This guy is a outright liar. About 88% of when you fact check, about uh, uh, about 80% of the time, he's lying. Dailycause.com uh, looked at 158 statements from him. 78% were false, okay? Uh, and we tried to warn people. But, you know, what, what happened? People wanted to vote for white supremacy and racism. That's what happened. People wanted to vote for white supremacy and racism. And um, there's an article from... Um, I talked about it this morning on the show. There's an article from, well, I have three articles dealing with it. The most recent one is from uh, thenation.com, thenation.com. Ch check out thenation.com. Now, Ari Berman uh, has written a series of articles for The Nation dealing with uh, voter suppression, things like this, right? But there's an article from uh, Sean McElwee and Jason McDaniel, and this looks at a recent study. They have the data now. Economic anxiety did not make people vote Trump. Racism did. Economic anxiety did not make people vote Trump. Racism did. Now, we have the data now to prove what we've been saying, that these people voted for white supremacy and racism. They voted for a white supremacist, bigoted, bigoted misogynistic, sexual predator at all costs. Fifty-three percent of white women voted for this guy. Now, we tried to tell them. And black women tried to save America because 96% of black women voted for Hillary Clinton, okay? But 53% of white women wanted to vote for this sexual predator, okay? The admitted sexual predator, white supremacist, pathological liar, and, look, and this is what you're dealing with, okay? This, and this is what you're dealing with. Check out this article from thenation.com. Economic anxiety didn't make people vote Trump. Racism did. All right. I want to get through... Uh, briefly some of these articles here okay all right so you have the big the bombshell article from CNN last night two bombshells came Wednesday night May 10th the one article from CNN all the news outlets picked it up source close to Comey says that there were two reasons the FBI director was fired one Comey never provided the president with any assurance of personal loyalty Two, the fact that the FBI's investigation into possible Trump team collusion with uh, Russia in the 2016 election was accelerating, was accelerating because th things are getting, things are about to get hot. Okay. Now there was a, um, uh, there was a big story from, 
Wall Street Journal, and I thought I pretty oh, this one right here. Rachel Maddow talked about this story tonight. Comey's fine. This is Wall Street Journal. This this article came out May tenth, two thousand seventeen. Posted ten o two p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Comey's firing came as investigators stepped up Russia probe. Comey's firing came as investigators stepped up Russia probe. In the weeks before President Donald Trump fired FBI Director James Comey, a federal investigation into potential collusion between Trump associates and the Russian government was heating up as Mr. Comey became increasingly occupied with the probe increasingly occupied with the probe. Now, just last week, he testified in front of the U.S. Senate again, okay? Mr. Comey started receiving daily instead of weekly updates on the investigation. This is reporting from the Wall Street Journal that came out Wednesday, May 10th. FBI Director James Comey started receiving daily instead of weekly updates on the, on the FBI investigation beginning at least three weeks ago, according to people with knowledge of the matter, and the progress of the Federal Bureau of Investigation probe, okay? Check this out. Mr. Comey was concerned by information showing possible evidence of collusion, according to these people. Now, this is reported by the, by the Wall Street Journal, Wednesday, May 10th, okay? He, it, so he's seeing this. He's getting daily instead of weekly updates. He's looking at possible evidence of collusion between the Trump campaign and Russia. And I'm, I'm telling you, they're going to find the evidence is there. It's going to come out that there was collusion. It's going to come out that there was collusion. And Representative Adam Schiff, the ranking Democrat on the House Intelligence Committee, in the last three or four weeks, he sees the most sensitive classified information. In the last three or four weeks, he came out publicly and said he has seen evidence of collusion between the Donald Trump campaign and Russia. He said that on MSNBC, okay? White House officials said Wednesday, May 10th, that, that Donald Trump had, had for months been contemplating the possibility of removing James Comey and that, the dismiss, and that the dismissal this week wasn't connected to the Russian probe. They just lied because he admitted on Thursday that it was connected to the Russian probe. Okay? Let me repeat. The, the, the story keeps changing. And they're dealing with a pathological liar. But I think he's telling the truth this time. Okay? Their story keeps changing. On Wednesday, Wall Street Journal reported, White House officials said Wednesday that Mr. Trump had for months been contemplating the possibility of removing FBI Director, FBI Director James Comey and that the dismissal this week was not connected to the Russian probe. No, breaking news story is it was connected to the Russian probe, okay? And that's possibly, and that could possibly set him up uh, to be brought up on obstruction of justice charges, all right? Now, the other bomb that dropped Wednesday night, Wall Street Journal had a big article backed up by 30 sources, over 30, over 30 sources. Inside Trump's anger and impatience and his sudden decision to fire Comey. Inside Trump's anger and impatience and his sudden decision to fire Comey, okay? So in this article, it talks about, one of the things they talk about is that Trump was angry that James Comey would not support his baseless claim that President Barack Obama had his campaign offices wiretapped. Remember that? March 4th, he tweets this idiotic nonsense, and there's absolutely no evidence showing this, right? So this is so FBI Director James Comey wasn't going along with this. Okay? Because he's like, dude, this is there's no evidence. And when he testified on March 20th in front of the US Senate Intel Committee. FBI Director James Comey said, look, we've looked. There's no evidence of this. So Trump was mad because, one of the reasons, Trump was mad because Comey wouldn't sign off on this BS. Okay? Trump was angry. Now, this is the article. This is the bombshell that dropped Wednesday night. Two bombshells that dropped Wednesday night. One from CNN, the other from the Washington Post. Trump, uh, Trump was angry that Comey would not support his baseless claim 
that President Barack Obama had his campaign officers wiretap. Number one. Number two, Trump was frustrated with FBI director uh, when FBI director James Comey revealed in Senate testimony the breadth of the counterintelligence investigation into Russia's effort to sway the 2016 U.S. presidential election. Okay, that's two. Three, Trump fumed that Comey was giving was giving too much attention to the Russian probe and not enough attention to investigating leaks to journalists. So these are these are three things that they cite in this article that Trump was was furious about that led him to firing FBI director James Comey. And one of them is dealing with and, and one of them is dealing with the Russian with the Russian probe and that could bring that could lead him to be brought up on obstruction of justice charges. Okay? Now so name of this article, Inside Trump's Anger and Impatience and His Sudden Decision to Fire Comey. But also, they tried to blame uh, um, Deputy uh, uh, Attorney General Rod Rodenstein. They tried to put the blame on him. He's been on the job two weeks. They tried to say initially that the reason why uh, Comey, uh, the reason why Trump fired Comey was because of Rod Rodenstein's recommendation in a memo he put together. Well, we come to come to find out today in the uh, um, interview that Trump did with Lester Hope for uh, NBC. Come to find out, he had already planned to fire Comey before this before this memo was even put together. They tried to they tried to blame. Uh, this on the new guy. They tried to blame this on the new guy. Okay, Trump. Now check out this article from NBCNews.com. Trump interview with Lester Holt. President asked Comey if he was under investigation. Okay, and he calls Comey a showboat and a grandstander, all this type of stuff. Comey was doing his job. Okay, but um, in the interview, he said that. Um, Okay, so he says he's a showboat, he's a grandstander. Trump said of Comey and his wide-ranging interview with Holt. Um, but basically he said that he had already made up his mind to uh, fire him, okay, before the memo uh, was put together. All right, so um, check out those articles. White House FBI story unravels. This stuff is changing day by day. I would have broadcasted earlier, man, but there's so many twists and turns, and I'm trying to cover this, and I'm one person. Okay. So Comey had asked for uh, more money for FBI's Russia investigation. Okay, we got that. Now, um, so then, so today, who was testifying today in front of the U.S. Senate? You have the acting FBI director, Edwin McCabe. He, he testified today, okay? And you have the White House saying that, uh, like uh, Deputy uh, White House Press Secretary uh, um, Sarah Huckabee Sanders saying that you have a lot of people in the FBI who are happy that FBI Director James Comey was fired. And one of the reasons that uh, uh, Trump gave was that um, he didn't, he could no longer lead the FBI. He didn't have the support of the FBI, things like this. He wasn't respected, et cetera. Well, acting FBI Director uh, Edward McCabe, uh, Andrew McCabe, I should say, sorry, Andrew McCabe, he refuted, he refuted two of those claims today. He's been with the FBI 21 years, okay? Acting FBI Director Andrew McCabe refuted two main claims the White House has made about Comey's firing and the investigation into allegations of collusion between Russia, Russian intelligence and associates of President Donald Trump, okay? Um, McCabe called the FBI Russian investigation highly significant, number one because they were saying this is not a significant investigation. He said, no, it's highly significant, number one. Number two, he said that uh, basically something to the effect that uh, um, James Comey had uh, a lot of support in the, uh, in the FBI, okay, or something like overwhelming support, something like that. Okay, so which contradicts what uh, 
the Deputy White House Press Secretary was lying about today. Okay, so their stories keep changing day by day and they keep lying and they keep getting caught in lies. I've never seen anything like this before. Um, okay, so check out that article also. That, okay, there's an article from um, uh, thinkprogress.org. Thinkprogress.org, acting FBI director re refuted uh, key White House claims about Comey and Russia. Okay, acting FBI director refuted key White House claims about Comey and Russia. All right, uh, let's see. Okay, so how's everybody doing on Facebook tonight? All right. Okay, so follow this story. We're going to stay on top of this. Oh, now the other, other thing, and this is just at an insult to injury. So Donald Trump on Thursday, May 11th, Donald Trump signs an executive order establishing a voter fraud commission to investigate possible voter fraud in the 2016 election. Donald Trump signed an executive order on Thursday creating a commission aimed at investigating alleged voter fraud, a move that drew swift rebuke from civil liberty groups and liberal lawmakers amid worries the panel's work could seek to justify voter suppression. Trump's order establishes a commission to review alleged voter fraud throughout the American election system. Okay, now you know Donald Trump said that uh, there were between three to five million illegal people voting illegally in the U.S. during the 2016 election, and that's why Hillary Clinton won the popular vote by three million. So now he signs an executive order to investigate. There's no evidence of widespread voter fraud. He signs an executive order uh, on Thursday to, to investigate this. This is absolutely, absolutely ridiculous, okay? All right, how's everybody doing today? Uh, let me try to get some of your comments here. And I'm broadcasting on uh, Google Chrome, and I'm trying to, uh, to okay. Okay, Anita. Kent said doing fine. Okay, good. Um, you were self tired. Been covering all this stuff. I had to do, man, I had to do radio this morning at 7 a.m. I did two hours of radio this morning at 7 a.m. on 9, 10 a.m. the Superstation. Um, there's this other article that, uh, let me see, which one is this? Okay, so voter fraud. Uh, we've got the one. There's one from, um, talking about voter fraud, there's one from Wisconsin, there's one about Wisconsin, voter fraud in Wisconsin, and it's from thenation.com, okay, you all should check this out, it just came out in the last couple of days, okay, and I'm going to pull this up. Wisconsin's voter ID law suppressed 200,000 votes in 2016 in Wisconsin. Trump won by 22,748 votes. A new, a new study, because we have the studies now that show the impact of the voter ID laws in the 2016 election, the impact of the voter suppression, okay? We have the studies now that, that show this. Wisconsin voter ID law suppressed 200,000 votes in 2016, okay, in Wisconsin. Trump won Wisconsin by 22,748 votes. A new study shows how voter ID laws decreased turnout among African American and Democratic voters, all right? Check out, check out that article from, uh, we just posted, check out that article from uh, thenation.com, all right? Okay, uh, let's go quickly some of your comments and then what I'm going to do, I'm going to do a quick overview of uh, an online class that I teach, Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade. We just posted the link there for, you can register for that online class, it's only $40. Um, you can register for that online class, it's a five week, uh, 10 hour plus class and there's a lot of bonus content 
that you can watch. As soon as you register, you can watch hours of content, and you can watch last Friday's class. Okay, there's another, uh, let me see. I, I want to make sure I'm not missing any of these articles. Couple of them, a couple of them are kind of duplicates, but I want to make sure I'm not missing any of them. Um, oh, this big one. Senate Intel Committee subpoenas Michael Flynn and Russia probe. Senate Intel Committee subpoenas Michael Flynn and Russia probe. This is from Wednesday. All this, man, this stuff is changing by the hour. This is from Wednesday, May 11th. Donald Trump's former National Security Advisor, retired General Michael Flynn, was subpoenaed by the U.S. Senate Intelligence Committee on Wednesday. The committee led. Uh, uh, the, uh, the committee said it requested documents that members believe to be relevant to its investigation into alleged Russian meddling in the 2016 presidential election. So this stuff is uh, heating up. This stuff is heating up, and uh, Donald Trump could very well be brought up on uh, obstruction of justice. Uh, obstruction of justice. Uh, uh, charges based upon his own admission in the interview he did today with Lester Holt. This article from the New York Times. This is from Wednesday, May 10th. Days before firing, Comey asked for more resources for Russia inquiry. Days before firing, Comey asked for more resources for Russia inquiry. Okay. So, I mean, this thing is heating up. And if you missed, um, um, Acting a former acting attorney general Sally Yates. If you missed her testimony on Wednesday, okay. Um, when she testified was Wednesday. Was it Wednesday? I think it was Wednesday or one of those days. Or Tuesday. No, uh, Monday. It was Monday. All my days are run together. Five things we learned from Sally Yates' testimony on what the White uh, on what the White House knew about Michael Flynn. Read this article, Washington Post. Washington Post. Five things we learned from Sally Yates' testimony on what the White House knew about Michael Flynn. Check that out, also. Okay. All right. Let's go quickly. Uh, some of your comments. Okay. Bina Bina said, "I don't understand." How he has not been fired. How who has not been fired? Uh, Monday, yeah, it was Monday. All my days run together. And see, I watched the, the White House press secretary, uh, the White House uh, daily press secretary conferences. They, I, I watch those pretty much every day. Uh, and I watched Sally Yates' testimony on Monday. All my days are running together. Um. Okay, Phil Green said one of his own would be the downfall of Trump. Now you ain't gonna be you're not gonna be able to blame all this stuff on one person. You ain't gonna be able to, I mean, when all I'm telling you, I guarantee you, when all the information comes when all the evidence comes out, this is gonna make Watergate look like Sesame Street. When all the evidence comes out. Because this stuff is deep. And they and they and they are corroborating, they are corroborating corroborating elements of the thirty five page dossier as well, uh, that was put together by ex MI six agent Christopher Steele. They're they're they are steadily corroborating parts of that also. Marilyn Stovall says she was tough referring to Sally Yates. Yeah, her testimony. She kicked their asses in her testimony. Um and and she and and and, and she could I don't know if she wants to, she could probably file a wrongful termination lawsuit as well. Uh, his whole campaign, he praised Comey, then fired him. And also, some people speculate that he was jealous, that Trump was jealous also because Comey was getting a lot of press coverage as well, a lot of media coverage. Uh, can you imagine if it were Democrats? Well, imagine if something like this happened to President Barack Obama. Okay. Uh, Omari said it's the, the whole administration, including his kid. Yeah, it's the whole damn administration. It's not one or two people. It's the whole administration is corrupt to the core. It's Jared. He went to Jared. It's Jared. It's Ivanka. It's Kellyanne Conway. It's Sean Spicer. 
is governor is 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 vice president Mike Pence is Stephen K Bannon is ranks previous is all of them. They're gonna have to back up a dump truck to the White House. Okay, all right. Um, he said Morris Reed said it wasn't the voter fraud this time as the electoral college. Every four years they changed the voting right for black district North America. Well, what happened was, now this is something very important to understand. 2016 election was the first uh, election, pr first presidential election, that you did not have the full weight of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, okay? The Voting Rights Act of 1965, Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act was struck down by the um, 2013 Supreme Court, Supreme Court decision of Shelby County versus Holder. Shelby County is in Alabama, where Jeff Sessions is from, the Attorney General, Jefferson Beauregard Sessions III, white supremacist segregationist Attorney General. This is study Jeff Sessions, okay? The Holder, who was the defendant, was Eric Holder, Attorney General, okay? So Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act gets struck down. The current Attorney General, Jeff Sessions, he was a U.S. Senator at the time. He cheered the gutting of the Voting Rights Act because he's from the South and it just changed his people's ways of, way of life. The Voting Rights Act of 65. So after that happened, after that was struck down, Section 5 was struck down, which was the pre-clearance, which stated that in, this, in the southern states that had a history of putting impediments in the way of African Americans voting, before they made any changes to the voting laws or anything like this, they had to get federal uh, approval. There was federal oversight over this. So as soon as that struck down, then you start having a, a new round of voter ID law. So this, this presidential election, you have 14 states that had new voter ID laws. And there are other things associated with them. They, they, usually they're not just saying you have to have a certain type of photo ID. They, what they did was in many states like North Carolina, they reduced the number of weeks for early voting. And also across the country, the nation.com had an article about this. There were 868 fewer, 868 fewer voting locations this year also. Okay. Um, We'll pull up that article here. Yeah, so the so this this was huge. So so you had rampant voter suppression that depressed the African American vote. It depressed it. The studies I'm seeing about by about seven percent. Donald Trump won Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. These three battleground states. He won by seventy eight thousand votes. He won each one of those states by less than one tenth of a percentage point. Okay, or well, about sorry, by less than one percentage point. Um. There, there are 868 fewer places to vote in 2016 because the Supreme Court gutted the Voting Rights Act, okay? Now, this is an example. I keep, I, I keep explaining to people, you see my broadcast, people think voting doesn't matter, things like that. No, it does matter. If, if, if your vote didn't matter, why would these Europeans go through such trouble to keep you from voting if your vote didn't matter? These are the questions you should ask yourself. 868 less places to vote. 14 new, 14, new state, 14 new voter ID laws in 14 states. Going to court, fighting these lawsuits, things like that, that costs money for them. If your vote didn't matter, why would they go to, to such extreme measures to keep you from voting? Nearly half, of, nearly half of the counties that previously approved voting changes with the federal government have cut polling places this election. Why is that? That wasn't because of budget, no. No, they're trying to, and, and, and a large percentage of these counties had high African-American populations also. Read, read that article from, um, from the nation.com. Um, okay. All right, so what I'm going to do is um, we posted the information here, and uh, I'm going to do a quick overview of an online class I teach, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school. This class meets on Fridays, uh, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. All the sessions are recorded. We do the class live. All the sessions are recorded. We just posted the information there. 
to register. Usually when I do an overview, you can see the presentation because I'm broadcasting through Crowdcast through uh, Facebook. There were some technical difficulties and because uh, I broadcast for the first time with technical difficulties, we had to stop and broadcast again here. So I'm doing it through Google. So you can't see my PowerPoint presentation, but we do a slide presentation. We have video clips, articles, books, everything. Okay. So it's a 10 hour course, uh, uh, five, two hour sessions. All the sessions are recorded. As soon as you register, you can start watching. Uh, you can watch the class we did last Friday. And also there's, um, we have hours of bonus, we have like eight hours of bonus content as well, all right? So the name of this class is Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school, okay? And I'm the teacher of Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecturer, and writer. You see me in some documentaries like Black Friday, What Legacy Will You Leave, Resurrecting Black Wall Street, The Blueprint. Um, and there's a new documentary coming out in two or three months, um, Elementary Genocide Part 3 that I'm in with uh, Professor Kava Kamene and um, Professor James Small. I'm featured in that documentary. The two other documentaries coming out this year I'm in also. So we'll tell you about those later. Okay, so this class, we deal with thousands of years of history. Now, when we deal with the transatlantic slave trade, we cannot deal with the transatlantic slave trade episodically. It was not an episode in history. We have to deal with how a sequence of historical events lead up to a particular event happening. One of the first things we deal with is that African people have been in the land we call the United States of America for tens of thousands of years, at least 51,700 years, Okay. We did not all come here on slave ships, okay? We did not all come here on slave ships, okay? Um, Chaz Bernie said, Willie Lynch said, said generation. Well, now we deal with Willie Lynch in the class because Willie Lynch never historically existed, okay? Willie Lynch never historically existed, so we just need to live, we, leave Willie Lynch out of this. He ain't had nothing to do with it. And we give, we give false things uh, too much power. We give lies and false things and all, all this stuff. We give them too much power, okay? The Woody Lynch letter 1712 was written in 1970 by Dr. Kwabina Ashanti. Uh, and there, there's language in that letter that didn't even exist in the early 18th century. That letter's been proven to be a fraud, okay? Uh, Nita Sunshine said the class is uh, excellent. Okay, thanks, Nita. Um, let's see. All right. I had to refresh that screen, so I lost some of the comments. Um, all right. So, it, you know, one of the um, sources we cite is Dr. David M. Hotep. He wrote the book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. And he deals with evidence of an African presence in this country we call the United States of America going back at least 51,700 years ago. At least 51,700 years ago. So when we discuss the transatlantic slave trade, we have to first understand that African people are indigenous to North, Central, and South America. Yes, the transatlantic slave trade happened, but we were here long before August 20th, 1619, okay? And I deal with the 1619 myth, the myth that the history of African people started in this country August 20th, 1619. That's just not true at all. We were here for tens of thousands of years before that. We were here before Native Americans came into existence also, okay? All right, now, um, we can't start studying our history in slavery even when uh, we study the transatlantic slave trade, which is, which is important to study, we can't start in 1619. We can't start in the 1440s when the Portuguese get involved and the Portuguese are going to dominate the transatlantic slave trade for the first 200 years. We have to understand the history uh, chronologically, okay? Some people deal with the transatlantic slave trade episodically as an episode in history. You can't deal with it like that. You have to deal with it chronologically. We deal with the 800-year occupation of the Africans known as the Moors, who go into the Iberian Peninsula, the day known as Spain and Portugal, in 711 AD. And they're taking teachings with them coming from ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt, the mystery systems. And these teachings are going to bring Europe out of the Dark Ages. So we deal with the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors, what they introduce into Europe, the uh, spherical globes, the almanacs, the, uh, what they call alchemy, today we call it chemistry. Um, they introduce information that's gonna lay the foundation for Freemasonry, okay? 
because you're going to have a group called the Poor Knights of Christ who are going to get a hold of this information. They're formed during the Second Crusade, 1118 A.D. And they're going to become known as the Knights Templar. And they're going to get this information and become very powerful. And when they're disbanded around 1310 or 1314, October 13th, which is on a Friday, and uh, Friday the 13th, this is said to be one of the reasons why people fear Friday the 13th. And the fear of Friday the 13th is called Frigga Triskaidekaphobia. Frigga Triskaidekaphobia, okay? And Frigga or Freya or Freya was the name of the wife of Odin. Odin in Scandinavian mythology, father of Thor and Loki, Odin. So the, the, the day of the week, Friday, is named after Freya or Freya or Frigga, depending upon which European language you, you, you're dealing with, you'll see variations of her name, okay? So uh, this was said to be the day that the knowledge stopped, the day the Knights Templar were disbanded, all right? And when those teachings go, uh, those teachers are going to go underground when they're disbanded, and they're going to resurface as the Scottish Rite to the Freemasons, as the Rosicrucians, these other secret societies or societies or secrets. And those teachings are going to come to the U.S., Jamestown, Virginia, 1607, the 13 colonies, because 50 of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence, when it was signed uh, July 4, 1776, and most of them don't sign it until August 2nd, 1776, about 50 of them don't sign it until August 2nd, or, or, or August 2nd, 1776, 50 of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence were Freemasons, okay? So this is why you see uh, ancient Kemet, ancient Africa, references to ancient Africa on the $1 bill. And the layout of Washington, D.C. is based upon ancient African principles. We know Benjamin Banneker, who had a photographic memory, uh, uh, he did the layout of Washington, D.C. is based upon ancient African principles. This is where you get the Tekken, the obelisk, the Washington Monument, which is a Tekken, which goes back to the story of Asar, Aset, and Heru, who the Greeks called, uh, who the Greeks called uh, Osiris, Isis, and Horus. And the Tekken, the Washington Monument, comes out of Freemasonry, but comes from ancient Kemet and is a symbol of resurrection, coming from that story of Asar, Aset, and Heru. So we deal with all this, we deal with thousands of years of history in this online course, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school. And we try to deal with things chronologically as much as possible because you have to understand how history, uh, historical events don't happen in a vacuum. They are the result of a sequence of other historical events that take place that have a domino effect that lead to uh, a larger event happening, okay? So you can register for this online course. It's, uh, it meets on Friday, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, all the sessions are recorded, so if you miss a session, you have to work or what have you, you can go back and watch it over and over again. If you need me to post a link again so you can register for this course, let me know. We'll post it again. The course is only $40. It's five weeks, uh, two hours each. Sometimes we go over, so there's extra. And as soon as you register... You can watch last Friday's class, and there's also bonus content, uh, about eight hours of bonus content to watch also, okay? All right, so now, uh, so let's continue here quickly. Now, anytime I do, uh, anytime I speak, I do a presentation, I do lectures, things like that. Uh, I know I'm going to say some things people never heard before. I may say some things people don't like. I usually have people put their fingers together to form a circle. I usually say something like this. The space inside this circle represents my realm of knowledge. Whatever I think I know about, everything I think I know about, whatever I think I know is represented within the circumference of the circle. I must keep in mind that there's still things to know that exist outside the circumference of my own awareness, okay? So just because you know everything that you know about what you know does not mean you know everything there is to know about what you know. There's still things that exist outside the circumference of your own awareness. So Freemasonry is a type of fraternal order. It's a secret society. Mason means son of light. And son of light was one of the, it was a designation of, of those in ancient Kemet that went through 42 years of study in the uh, ancient Egyptian mystery system, ancient Kemetic mystery system. Okay, and light was a, a, a metaphor for knowledge because for thousands of years, light has been a metaphor for knowledge. And um, so uh, Freemasonry, uh, those, are, those are those who belong to the Masonic order, all right? 
and you 50 of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence were Freemasons. Freemasonry is loosely based upon teachings coming out of ancient Kemet, coming out of ancient Africa. Kemet meaning the land of the blacks, one of the original names for Egypt. Egypt is an Arabic word of Greek derivation. Egypt comes from the word Hekupata, which means land of the temple of Ta. And the Greeks called it Egyptos, A-I-G-Y-P-T-O-S, Egyptos. The uh, Romans and Latin called it Egyptus, A-E-G-Y-P-T-U-S, Egyptus. Arabs called it Egypt because all three of those groups conquered Egypt at one point. The Greeks invaded in 332 B.C. The Romans uh, invaded around 40, they conquered around 46 B.C. or so. The uh, Arabs uh, invaded in about 639 A.D. and conquered around 642, okay? So uh, Egypt is not what we call it. Kemet is one of the names. Also, Ta Mary, meaning the beloved land as well, okay? Um let me try to get some of your comments here. What about the black Freemasons? A lot of those are Prince Hall Masons. Some of them belong to some of the other Masonic orders, uh, Scottish Rites of the Freemasons, things like that. Um, okay, let's po we'll post a link here again. You can register for this online class, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Did I post the right thing here? Yeah, there we go. It says register here. Pin that comment. Okay. All right. Let's continue some. Okay, so um, some of the things we deal with in the online course, of course, we deal with what was the transatlantic slave trade. And normally you'll be able to see my slide presentation. Uh, we have graphics, all that information. We have video clips, things like this. But... Um, I was trying to broadcast, broadcast through Crowdcast and uh, it's running some technical difficulties, so I wanted to go ahead and, and broadcast, so we're doing it just through um, Facebook Live. So we do, well, what was the transatlantic slave trade? What exactly was it? How did it work? What were some of the events that led up to the transatlantic slave trade starting? And we deal with a chronology of history. I show you a timeline of history also. We do, well, what role did Christopher Columbus play? Now, this is extremely important. Because a lot of times when they talk about the transatlantic slave trade, they don't deal with Columbus and his four voyages. <clears throat> you can't do that. That's extremely important because Columbus and his four voyages helped to lay the foundation for slavery, racism, capitalism, the exploitation of indigenous people. And uh, he opened up his four voyages, opened up the so-called new world to other European nations coming in, exploiting uh, these, these new nations, Haiti, Jamaica, Puerto Rico, Cuba, Honduras, Panama, etc. Okay, they, they're decimating the populations, enslaving the people, extracting wealth out of the extracting mineral wealth, etc., gold and silver out of the out of the uh, earth, out of the land. They're setting up plantations like sugarcane plantations. Okay, because when you study Columbus, right, he was trying to uh, prove that you could. Uh, uh, go east by selling west. He was trying to find a route to the east, okay, to Asia. One of the things he was looking for was another source of sugar because a lot of the, because the Moors introduced sugar into Europe and a lot, of, a lot of Europeans had gotten hooked on sugar. And when, you, and when you see one of the things the Spanish do, one of the plantations they have are sugar cane plantations. In Cuba, they set up sugarcane plantations because Cuba was uncovered, I think it was in 1494, uh, on, on one of the four voyages of Columbus. And to this day, to this day, one of the, one of the top, I think it's one of the top three exports out of Cuba is sugar, which goes back to the history of the Spanish in Cuba. Okay, so this is the type of this is the type of history we, we deal with. Now, I show you where Columbus went on his four voyages. It's very important because we have to stop lying to our children, telling them that Columbus discovered America. Because there are a few reasons why that's impossible. Number one, at least seventy percent of the people Columbus encountered on his four voyages were African people. Number one. Number two, when you when you study where Columbus went, he never came to the land we call the United States of America. So we need to stop telling our children that. He goes into South America. He goes into Central America. He goes into the Caribbean. 
He never, he never comes to the land we call the United States of America. The closest he comes here is Cuba, which is 90 miles away. So we need to stop lying to our children, telling them that he discovered America. No, he did not. African people have, have been in North, Central, and South America for tens of thousands of years. South America going back at least 56,000 years ago. But there's new evidence pushing that back and, and going back 100,000 years ago. And in this land we call the United States of America at least 51,700 years ago, possibly 130,000 years ago because of the discovery that was revealed uh, April 26, 2017, uh, that came out of San Diego. And all the news outlets had this story about a 130,000-year-old mastodon skeleton that was found, and the experts are saying it was smashed by humans. It was smashed by humans, not by nature or other animals, okay? Which means that humans were in the land we call the United States of America, if this is correct, at least 130,000 years ago. And you're going to find out these were probably Homo sapiens sapiens. Because many of our scholars like Renoka Rashidi and Dr. Charles Finch and others, they've been saying Homo sapiens sapiens are not 75,000 years old or 100,000 years old, that we are at least 300,000 years old, okay? And Homo sapiens sapiens is, uh, are, are modern man. They've been saying that, that we are at least 300,000 years old. So we deal with archaeological discoveries in the course. We deal with the lost city of Egypt, Thomas Heraklion. We deal with the evidence found on the Greek island of Crete in 2011 of an African presence dating back 130,000 years ago. You know, uh, these discoveries are come out all the time. In April, there were three uh, major archaeological discoveries, one out of San Diego, two out of Egypt. They found a they found a uh, uh, a pyramid that dates back to the 13th dynasty, a 3,700 year old pyramid in Egypt, and they found eight mummies uh, date, that date back 3,500 years ago. These discoveries happen all the time. The deeper they dig, the blacker the planet gets. The more research they do, the older we get. The deeper they because they have they, when you do when you study these archaeological findings, they keep having to push back dates. With, with the one um, coming out of um, uh, San Diego, they said, they said, we have to start now looking for humans in places we never thought we had to look before. They said this discovery changes everything. They keep having to push dates back. And that discovery coming out of San Diego flipped the archaeological world upside down. Uh, let me see if I have. Let me see if I have an uh, article dealing with that because I have so many of them. Oh, you know what? I think I put that. I think I put that in my folder for um, the class because we deal with that in the class, understanding transatlantic slave trade. This is my folder for the class on Richard Nixon's war on drugs. I teach that class also, how Richard Nixon's war on drugs was a war in the African-American community. Uh... This is Great African Women in History, the Mothers of Civilization. That's another class I teach. That's the file folder for that. Okay, this is, uh, let me see, do I have that? Where do I put those articles? Okay, must be in another file folder. Hold on. Oh, here we go. I knew I had it here because I take, I take a bunch of articles to the radio station with me. When I do my when I do my shows and my segment, okay. So NBC News had a big article. You check this out: Mastodon bone findings could up in our understanding of human history. If you just Google 130,000 year, uh, 130,000 year mastodon, okay, just Google this. You Google that, all these articles come up: NBC News, ABC, uh, Discovery Channel. Uh, uh, Scientific American, uh, Wired.com, Los Angeles Times, Washington Post, New York Times, all these articles come up. This is a huge story, uh, and we dealt with this in the class, okay? Paleontologists have dug up a 130,000-year-old mastodon skeleton that looks like it was smashed apart by humans, but they found it in America what well, people were not supposed to have arrived for another 100,000 years. So they've been going by the Clovis culture finding in New Mexico that dates back 13,000 years ago. They've, they, they've cited that as the uh, oldest 
uh, evidence of Homo sapiens sapiens here. But the discovery that Dr. Albert Goodyear made in 2004 shows an African presence going back at least 51,700 years in Allendale County, South Carolina. But uh, many in the archaeological world have been trying to suppress this information. Okay, then you have this discovery right here. And Dr. David M. Hotep, that's one of his sources. He has 713 footnotes in his book. We deal with this book in the class, The First Americans Were Africans Documented Evidence. Okay, Dr. David M. Hotep, no relation to me. I just interviewed him uh, this past Sunday on uh, my show, the African History Network show. You can listen to uh, the podcast of my shows. We have uh, over 700 podcasts. Go to AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. And um, you can listen to podcasts there, and uh, all my DVD lectures uh, are there also. So I have uh, 30 of my lectures on DVD if you want to order any of those, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. So we'll be here for a few more minutes, and I have to get out of here. So they say, how could this happen? They said, but, but th th this skeleton, this Mastodon skeleton. Now, Mastodon is a precursor to um, elephants, okay? It's a, like a pre prehistoric animal, all right? They found this skeleton in America where people were not supposed to have arrived for another 100,000 years, okay? The researchers say they think early humans must have come to America much, much earlier than anyone ever thought. They suggest that other scientists start looking for evidence of people in places they never bothered looking before. The deeper they dig, the blacker the planet gets, the more research they do, the older we get. So we deal with archaeological discoveries in the class also, okay? So we can wrap our heads around this and try to deal with some things chronologically, okay? And one of the things we deal with is expanding our circumference of awareness because we have been taught to, 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 to stay in a 1619, to operate based upon this 1619 myth. This is why you have a slave television show on right now called Underground to keep you in a slave mentality. This is why 2013 was called the year of the slave themed movies because you had seven slave themed movies that came out in 2013. They keep showing you images of you being a slave. You had a remake of Roots, okay, in, uh, uh, in last May 2016. They keep showing you these images of you enslaved to keep you in a slave mentality because your thoughts create feelings your feelings create actions and behaviors your actions and behaviors create results your thoughts create feelings your feelings create actions and your, your thoughts create feelings your feelings create actions and behaviors your actions and behaviors create results okay so when you can control the circumference of someone's awareness and you can control the information that is within someone's circumference of uh, uh, circumference of awareness you can ultimately uh, influence, predict, and control their results because you're controlling their, their access to information, which influences their thoughts, which influences the way they think, feel, their, their feelings, which influences their behaviors. Okay, so some of the other things we deal with. So we deal with Christopher Columbus a lot. We have to talk, have to talk about Columbus. Uh, we do. When did Africans? Um, um, we deal with when did? Uh, let's see. We deal with when did Africans um, come to um, the U.S. We deal with that also. Extremely important. When did Africans first come to the U.S. as slaves? Because we were even, even enslaved. We were enslaved before. Uh, 1619, August 20, 1619 in the U.S. We were here in South Carolina almost 100 years before that. We do it. Did Africans sell themselves into slavery? We did with that complicated history because the way some people like Dr. Henry Louis Gates uh, tells it, it's not exactly how it happened. Um, we deal with um, were African people in America before the slave trade, okay? We deal with that extensively. Were African people in America before the slave trade? Um... We do the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors, uh, shocking archaeological discoveries that are causing experts to have to rethink everything. We deal with the role insurance companies played in the slave trade as well. Because some of your oldest insurance companies got their start insuring 
um, slave ships, okay, and the Africans on the slave ships, but also, and a lot of people don't know this, but also uh, you had insurance companies that would take out insurance policies on slaves on the plantations in this country because there were at least 262 skills, trades, and crafts that African people had in this country up until 1865, okay? There were at least 200, okay, somebody posted 1555, actually before 1555, we can go back to the 1520s in South Carolina. The Spanish were taking Africans into uh, South Carolina in the 1520s. But that was, uh, South Carolina was not one of the um, 13 colonies, but this was under Spanish rule. Because you're going to have the Spanish here, you're going to have the Dutch. New York was a Dutch colony. You have the Dutch taking Africans into the colony today called New York. They called it New Amsterdam. And at the northern point of that colony, they're going to force these Africans to build a wall. That's a wall to keep out Native Americans coming in trying to attack. And then New Amsterdam becomes a British colony called New York. You have York in England and then you have New York. Okay? And where that wall was is where Wall Street gets its name from. And the first commodity traded on Wall Street were African people. So when you deal with the history of Wall Street, you deal with slavery. The Wall Street has its origins going back to slavery. These are some of the things we deal with in the class. The online class okay all right so um we posted the link there we have it it says register here but uh okay so are you all learning anything tonight i know it's getting late we're about to get out of here in a minute so we deal with insurance companies um we deal with some of the skills trades and crafts that african people had in this country up until 1865 we do a Freemasonry, America and the Founding Fathers. Uh, we do it the origins of the term America and origins of the term Africa. Africa was not named after a Roman soldier named Publius Cornelius Scipio. Okay, we need to stop telling that lie. I don't know where the hell that thing started, but we need to stop telling that lie. That's not true. It's not true historically or linguistically. His family's last name wasn't even Africanus. His family's last name was Scipio. Okay. We deal with the problem with slave movies, why we've been bombarded with slave movies and a slave television show. Uh, we talk about the uh, first holy trinity of Asar, Aset, and Heru, and the origins of the Immaculate Conception story, the adoration of virgin birth. That's a very ancient story that dates back to at least 3300 BC in ancient Nubia. Okay, Nubia, uh, also called Ta-Nehisi. Nubia today is the Sudan. And there are more pyramids in the Sudan than there are in Egypt. There are about 235 pyramids in the Sudan, about 125, 135 in, in Egypt. Because the Sud it's because Nubia was the mother to ancient Kemet. Because the civilization went up the Nile River. So uh, Kush, or which was a region, and Ethiopia was in that region. Ethiopia or Abyssinia is the mother, is the grandmother to ancient Kemet, and the mother is Nubia or ta -Nehisi. So these are some of the things we deal with in the class. Um, all right, Marvis Brown said, yes, sir. Uh, Omri uh, Cloak said, learning lots. Okay. Uh, thank you for sharing. All right. Okay. So. How many people want to register for this online class? We'll post the link again if you need me to. It meets on Fridays, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, where they didn't teach you in class. Now, this, this online class is only $40, only $40. And when I teach it, we have, you know, graphics and slides, all this stuff. Video clips, a lot of references, etc. Um... The whole class is recorded, so you can go back and watch it over and over again, okay, the video. You can ask questions during the class also with the live chat. As soon as you register tonight, you can, um, as soon as you register, there's, uh, you can watch last, fr last Friday's class. 
And we also have about eight hours of bonus content you can watch also. Okay. All right. How you doing, Kim Hodges? Uh, Walicia Robinson, how you doing? Uh, Chaz, okay, reach one, teach one. I truly thought uh, Willie Lynch book was true. No. Yeah, there is a Willie Lynch book. Willie Lynch never historically existed. And when you study, when you read the slave narratives, when you study abolitionists, when you study history, they do not, they don't talk about a Willie Lynch anywhere throughout history, okay, in the, in the 18th century. In the 19th century, there was a Captain Willie Lynch. That was a different person, okay? This, this was somebody who was made up, all right? Um, so we deal with um, links to ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt and early Christianity because we deal with some of the history of religion in the class as well. And we have to understand that world history is in world history books. Religious, relig, religious literature and world history are two entirely different things. Now what I say may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness. It doesn't mean that it's not true. It just means you have to do some research to understand what I'm talking about, okay? And we'll post the link again here so you can register for this online course, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa. The uh, world history is what happened. World history is what happened. Religious literature is the result of what happened. You have to understand this. You have to, if you understand world history, you understand it. World history are the historical events that actually happened. Religious literature is the result of the historical events that actually happened. So when you read the Helios Biblos, the sun book or the Bible, Helios referring to sun, S-U-N, not S-O-N. When you read the Bible, that is the result of the ecumenical councils that took place between 325 A.D. with the first council of Nicaea and uh, ecumenical councils up until about 1870. The, 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 the way people practice Christianity, what they believe, what's taught, what is in the Bible, the books taken out of the Bible, like the book of Jubilee, the book of Enoch, things like this, the books taken out of the Bible. These are things that are the result of historical events like the first council in the Nicaea 325 AD, the Council of Constantinople of 381, the Council of Ephesus of 481, the Council of Chalcedon of 451, the Council of Trent, which ties into the Gregorian calendar that we use today, introduced in 1582 by Pope Gregory the 13th. The Council of Trent, which is in three parts, 1545 to 1563. And one of the results of the Council of Trent was to revert back to the celebration of Easter tied into the vernal equinox being celebrated on the first Sunday following the first full moon following the vernal equinox. What, what determines when Easter is celebrated is based upon uh, the vernal equinox, which occurs on March 20th or March 21st. And, a, and vernal in Latin means spring. Equinox uh, means equal nights, okay? The first day of spring is March 20th or March 21st. Spring has nothing to do with a rodent seeing the shadow or not seeing the shadow. Uh, so Easter is celebrated each year on the first Sunday following the first full moon following the vernal equinox. This is what determines when Easter is celebrated, okay? So what happened was when the Julian calendar was introduced around 46 BC by Julius Caesar, the astronomer that put together the, 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 the calculations for the calendar was also called the Roman calendar, the Julian calendar. The one who did the calculations, um, his name was Sosigenes, Sosigenes. His calculations were off by 11 minutes and about 14 seconds, something like that. Okay, so this is around 46 BC. So by the 1500s, they're celebrating Easter. It's 10 days off from when the vernal equinox happens. So one of the results of the Council of Trent, which ends in 1563, is to revert back to 
uh, when Easter was celebrated, going back to the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. And they, and they create a new calendar called the Gregorian calendar introduced by Pope Gregory the 13th in 1582 AD. And the Gregorian calendar is based upon how long it takes the earth to rotate around, uh, to, to rotate around the sun. It takes 365 days, five hours, 48 minutes and 45.51 seconds. That's known as a solar year. That's how long it takes the earth to rotate around the sun. Okay. So you know it is 365 days and one quarter. This is where you get the this is where you get your calendar from that's hanging on your wall or that's on your smartphone. This is where that comes from, that calculation. Okay? And they said that they were and so they had to correct the calculation to correct when Easter is celebrated. All right? Now this is not in the biblical text. But this influences how people cr practice Christianity. World history is in world history books. Okay. Religious literature and world history are two entirely different things because the ecumenical councils that, that influence and determine how people practice Christianity is nowhere in the biblical text. You may see it in the footnotes. If you, if you read like a, a study Bible, but there's nowhere in the biblical text. So this is why you have to make a clear distinction between whether you're talking about world history or religious literature, because those are two entirely different things. Okay. All right. So these are some of the things that we deal with in this online course and a lot more ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. This is a, um, it's uh, we meet on it class meets live on Friday, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, you can. Um, all the sessions are recorded, so if you can't tune in live, that's fine. And I teach the course. I'm Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation in Detroit. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecturer and writer. You visit my website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. I have a lot. We have a lot of information there. We have a recommended reading list of books. Uh, all of my lectures are there, also. Okay, and um, we have um, video clips there, also. It's a lot of information there. Okay. All right, and let's see here. The other classes also. Oh, you know what? I set up a bundle pack as well. Uh, I forgot to tell you this. Glad I remembered. Uh, we have a bundle pack also. You can register for four of my courses on different topics for um, eighty dollars, regularly one hundred twenty dollars. This includes the class uh, "Great African Women in History: The Mothers of Civilization." This includes the class on. Um, how Richard Nixon's war on drugs was the war in the African American community. Also, Empire Strikes Black, the propaganda of the media. Okay, so we just posted that. So we have a bundle pack. Um, you can register uh, with that bundle pack. You can register for uh, four of my uh, classes at a discounted price. Also, okay. All right. So uh, let me see if there are any more comments we have to get to. So how y'all doing tonight? I know some people had to go to bed. You know people in different time zones. I'm about to get out of here also. It's been a long day. Very busy day. I've been covering all these stories. And this thing with Comey. This thing just came out of the clear blue also. And it took everybody, man. Donald, Donald Trump does not know how much worse he made things for himself. He, I mean, this is the one of the dumbest ass people I've ever seen in my life. Okay. But he has no idea how much worse he's made it for himself. And he tried to take the focus off of Russia and he put the focus back on Russia. He put the focus back on Russia. Um, so Kim Hodges said, are there any books you can suggest we become familiarized with as we watch the videos? Um, Nile Valley Contributions, there's some books we use in the course, Nile, Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization by Tony Browder. 
If you go to our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, we have a recommended reading list of books. So um, the, the books that I use in the course, you don't have to go out and buy these books to follow in the course. I use them for reference. Uh, but all the books that we use in the course are on our recommended reading list. Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization by Tony Browder is one of them. Nile, N-I-L-E. Um, Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome by Dr. Joy DeGruy. Egypt on the Potomac by Tony Browder. Those are a few of them. Um, First Americans were Africans, documented evidence by Dr. David M. Hotep is another one. First Americans were Africans, documented evidence by Dr. David M. Hotep. You can start with those. Um, so those, those are some of the things we deal with, okay? All right. And if you saw my broadcast this... Um, I got to do a broadcast. If you saw the broadcast this morning, 19 a.m., the Superstation, we dealt with Andrew Jackson, Indian killer, slave owner, uh, Andrew Jackson, slave owner, Indian killer, and hero of Donald Trump. We talked about the May 1st, 2017 interview Donald Trump did where he talked about um, Andrew Jackson was a hero of his and uh, Andrew Jackson could have stopped the Civil War if he had been around, and I don't think he knew that Andrew Jackson died 16 years before the Civil War. But we also talked about the history of Mother's Day, so I'm, I'm going to have to do a broadcast probably Friday or Saturday deal with the history of Mother's Day because a lot of people don't understand the history of Mother's Day. Okay? Uh, so we'll deal with that also because Mother's Day is uh, Sunday. All right? And Mother's Day has a very, very interesting history also. Okay, guys, look, we got to get out of here. You can register for the courses. You can visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com also. Share this broadcast on your own Facebook page. Invite your friends to tune in. Uh, oh, also at our website, download the document. Um, um, what's the name of that document? What Did Trump Do? Download this document from our website right on the home page. This is from the Congressional Black Caucus. What did Trump do? What did Trump do? The first 100 days. This is a hashtag stay woke list. So this is from the Congressional Black Caucus, right? And I downloaded it, took it to the printer, got it printed up. So this document deals with 100 actions Donald Trump has taken in the first 100 days of his regime and the negative impact it's had on African Americans, okay? And this is an example of how elections have consequences all these rappers telling us don't vote, all this nonsense, these black political pundits, pseudo-intellectual scholars telling us don't vote. Now these Negroes can't tell you what to do. Where are they now? They can't tell you what to do. Okay? All the people who were talking about how terrible President Barack Obama was, all this, all these black people, the ones that had poverty pimp tours across the country, where are they now? You have a kleptocracy going on right now. Kleptocracy is a government ran by the worst people. Where are they now? Okay? So check this out because this deals with different categories, everything from environmental justice uh, to uh, uh, voting rights to housing and home ownership, immigration, uh, uh, women, children, and seniors, homeland security, health care, uh, environment and environmental justice, education, economic development, crime justice and reform, everything. And so when people talk about how, oh, it doesn't matter who you vote for, pull this out on them. Because this has 100 items, 100 actions that have happened in the first 100 days of the Donald Trump administration. And it shows you how this impacts our lives. It shows you the negative impact that this has had on African Americans. So we have to understand politics impacts every aspect of our life. Politics impacts every aspect of our life. And two main ways to understand politics, and I'm going to get out of here. Two main ways to understand politics. Number one, politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources. The legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources. Number two, politics is the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments, treaties, uh, their, uh, their interpretation, adoption, and enforcement. The writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, ordinances, amendments, and treaties. Their adoption, interpretation, and enforcement. 
So a lot of people don't understand politics like that. And we have to have a synthesis. The foundation is African history and culture, which gives you your VIPs, your values, your interests, and your principles. And it gives you a cultural paradigm that you see reality through and influences your economic empowerment and your political empowerment. So if, you, if that foundation is not in place, it doesn't matter how much money you have, you won't know what to do with the money. Okay, so we have a $1.3 trillion economy as African Americans, 97% of our dollars are spent with people that don't look like us because that foundation is not in place. Every ethnic group in America, their history and culture teaches them uh, that the only way they're going to survive is through self-reliance, number one. Number two, they use their history and culture to fight for scarce wealth, power, and resources. So every ethnic group in America, they're the number one employees of their own people because they have that foundation in place. African Americans, our history and culture, for the most part, has been stripped away from us because of white supremacy and racism. This is why 97% of our dollars are spent with people that don't look like us because that foundation is not in place. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you have been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. Okay? All right, Marcel Joseph said, why does the Census Bureau record Egyptian as a subsidiary of, of white? Well, they, don't, they don't record them as a subsidiary of white. They record them as white. The reason why is because According to the U.S. government, people in North Africa are classified as white. People in the Middle East, Arabs, are classified as white by the U.S. government. Go to the 2000, go to census.gov, search for the 2010 census form, and when it gives you the racial classifications for white, it tells you that those, those from North Africa, they talk about Egypt, okay, other North African countries, they are classified as white by the U.S. government. Because over, because different periods of time, the concept of white gets changed to bring other people into the white family, the family of white, family of white supremacy. There was a time when the Irish were not classified as white. They were looked at as, as the bottom upon Europeans. Uh, Greeks and Italians were not classified as white until the end of World War II. All right. Okay. So, hey, we got to get out of here. So, red, you can register for the class. Uh, we'll post the link again here. You can register for the class. Oh, you know what? Also, we have the Hidden Colors Family Bundle Pack. Get all four installments of Hidden Colors and get four of my DVD lectures for one low price as well. Uh, but uh, we'll post the uh, thing here. We have the um, bundle pack also. Um, you can register for all four courses, and so, as soon as you register, most of those, this content you can already watch, classes you can already watch, bonus content, things like this. And then um, uh, we have the class uh, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa meets on Fridays. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school, okay? As soon as you register for that, you can start watching content also. So you'll be ready for class on Friday. Hey, remember, um, on the, at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's corrects wrong behavior. What you do for yourself, what, the, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you is based upon what you think about yourself. It's not over till we win. We'll talk to you next time. Peace.